into danger to save lives and serve our nation. I hope that every American can take comfort in the fact that in the face of unbelievable tragedy, this country has always come together to heal, protect, and save. From the firefighters and police officers who rushed into burning buildings on 9-11, to the first responders on the ground in Florida, the United States Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. FEMA, through its National and Regional Response Coordination Centers and liaisons to the National Hurricane Center, continues to actively monitor the track of Hurricane Irma and support local authorities responding to the damage the storm has already caused. I'd like to bring up Tom Bossert, the President's Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor, to provide an update on issues related to Hurricanes Irma and Harvey before I take questions. As always, he'll make, he'll make an opening statement and take questions, and then I'll be back up to answer further questions. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a somber day uh, today, and, uh, and I and Sarah and others were honored to join the President at the Pentagon uh, in a moment of uh, silence on the South Lawn as well. Uh, in addition, I would note that President Trump continued a long tradition of presidents uh, since 9-11 to receive a counterterrorism briefing this morning in the Oval Office from his intelligence community, uh, from his director of National Counterterrorism Center, from myself and others on the team. The uh, purpose of that is to give the president a sense of the terrorist threat that exists globally into the homeland and give him a sense of what we're doing about it and make sure that he's comfortable with our posture. Uh, as I said the other day, we don't have any current uh, active threats against the homeland uh, to our knowledge, and uh, that's, that's a good news story for today. Uh, let me move into a uh, quick thought. Before I do it, though, uh, Sarah noted that we created the Department of Homeland Security in the wake of 9-11. Uh, I would note that the government engaged in a massive reorganization of its structures and efforts to create a National Counterterrorism Center, to create a Department of Homeland Security, an Office of the Director of National Intelligence, a U.S. Northern Command, which you've seen now marshal resources uh, in an expert fashion for this storm, a combatant command in the United States of America, uh, and Cyber Command, which you've seen recently President Trump elevate to a full combatant command. And so uh, we've, we've marshaled our resources and we've organized them in a way to, to confront the threat of terrorism, but also to organize ourselves in a way that will allow us to respond to any event from a man-made hazard uh, to an unfortunate uh, 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 terrorist attack but also to a hurricane. So uh, let me see if I can today talk to you about what we've done. I believe Harvey, as I said earlier, was the best integrated, unified, joint, federal, local, state response effort that our country has seen in its history. I uh, continue to stand by that. Uh, we've got roughly 700,000 registrants now for individual assistance in the greater Houston and South Texas area. Governor Abbott continues to demonstrate leadership, uh, and President Trump continues to work with him and direct his cabinet to not lose focus on the people of Texas. With respect to Hurricane Irma, as you now know, it's a tropical depression. That does not mean it's not a dangerous storm. Uh, as you'll see from reporting, Jacksonville is suffering what has been called early some of the worst flooding it has seen in 100 years. And so uh, the category might be reduced, but the effects on Jacksonville, for instance, when you combine storm surge and wind, uh, might now replicate that of a Category 3 storm, even though it's a tropical depression. So as that flooding is ongoing, uh, we have life-saving, life-sustaining operations underway, uh, and we are uh, prayerful that there are not people right now trapped by floodwaters. Uh, the President spoke this morning uh, to the Governor of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, governor Mapp expressed, and I joined that call, uh, his thankfulness to our administration's help, but to the U.S. government uh, providing such a rapid response and an ongoing response, I would add. So if I could on that, I'll speak to it later, but uh, the, the mobilization of our military in response to the, the storms in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands is the largest ever mobilization of our military in a naval and marine operation. And we now have an Air Force carrier uh, deployed in this effort. This is the first ever as well. So we have the largest flotilla operation in our nation's history to help uh, not only the people of Puerto Rico, the people of the U.S. Virgin Islands, but also of St. Martin and other non-U.S. islands affected and the people of Florida. Uh, with respect to Puerto Rico, the President spoke to uh, the Governor of Puerto Rico this morning around 11.30 a.m., uh, and they discussed uh, similarly how happy they were with the federal response to their, to their needs. Uh, the, the Governor communicated to the President that they still have a large uh, island-wide power outage problem that we are 
addressing as soon as we can. Uh, and then Florida, if I can speak to Florida, uh, I think Governor Scott has been demonstrating an outstanding leadership instinct in pressing forward, continuing the message of getting people out of harm's way, which, by the way, is an ongoing effort. The storm is still hitting the United States and Georgia and South Carolina. It will move up through uh, an inland flooding problem in Tennessee, uh, maybe North Carolina, as we see the storm progress. Governor Scott has, at this stage, uh, begun conducting overflight surveys of the Keys, and it looks like to the north and east of Key West, uh, the storms there took the, the, the islands there took the largest brunt of the storm. So uh, I'll be able to speak to that when we take questions. Uh, and then if I can come back um, to 9-11, I think the lesson we learned that day, among others, uh, was that not only does evil exist, but good people taking action can confront that. And what I've been reassured, uh, assured and reassured about over the last 24 hours is how many good people are taking action. So that's kind of my lesson for today. I'd like to take questions now. John. Uh, Tom, um, in the immediate aftermath of Harvey, uh, the federal response priority was to, to rescue people who were trapped by the enormous flooding. In the state of Florida, what's the priority for the federal government? Uh, there's a number of priorities for the federal government. Right now, because the storm's still ongoing, our priority is life-saving, life-sustaining. Jacksonville and the Keys are taking a considerable amount of our attention right now. Uh, but what you'll see in Florida, uh, and, and more broadly speaking as a comparative matter, uh, Houston and Harvey was an acutely narrow area of operations comparatively. What we have now is a large-scale area of operations. So what we're trying to do is marshal the resources where they're needed, and so it's a prioritization effort. Uh, we are worried about flooding, housing, debris, and power restoration. And power restoration is also a function of access to fuel, refined fuel. And so as you'll see the next days and weeks play out, we will have to clear debris from roadways so that people can gain reentry. Right now, though, the message is not to rush reentry. There are still dangerous conditions, downed electric lines, flood conditions, problems that would be compounded by your reentry. And so listen to your local officials not only about evacuation, but then about when and how to stagger your reentry for a reason. It's a, there's a life safety reason, a public safety reason. Uh, there's our priority set. Uh, eventually, we'll move into issues about recovery and insurance and so forth. Tom, what are you doing on the, on the fuel front? On the fuel front, what the federal government's doing uh, at this stage and what we did in the three or four days building up to this event was to get out of the way. And by that I mean we waived regulations, we waived rules, uh, we waived the Jones Act restrictions to free up additional capacity. Uh, Florida is a uniquely postured state in the way it receives refined fuel. It's not part of the, lo the larger pipeline system throughout the country. Uh, it receives fuel by shipper tank, uh, by ship tanker. Uh, those ship tankers then link into intermodal sites where they fill up trucks and trucks distribute. And so what we'll do is uh, clear those pathways, uh, assess those three uh, ports where those, those tankers dock, make sure they're not damaged, and we'll get things back up and running. And Florida Power and Light and others, uh, the nuclear power generation facilities, Duke Energy and others, uh, they'll continue with their professionalism and they'll bring those facilities back up as soon as possible. Uh, Sir. Yes, hi. Uh, do we have any agreements in place with the private sector uh, to contribute to the both the response and the recovery, talking about Costco, Home Depot, Walmart, so that we don't have to deplete the disaster relief fund yep. as so, a public service? Yeah, no, absolutely. So two things. First, there's a partnership in terms of coordination where those uh, private sector entities are actually built into our coordinating centers so that they can understand what we're doing and how to prioritize their reopening of facilities and the safety of their workforce. But secondly, it is our absolutely baseline doctrine nowadays in the emergency management community that we would rather reopen those stores than continue providing food, water, and temporary uh, shelter to people. Uh, it's just not within their regular course of operating business. It's not routine, and it's not something that we can easily sustain. So it's healthier, better, faster for us to reopen those stores as fast as possible. Dr. Thanks for that Dr. question. Dr. Mr. Sponsor, uh, the previous administration uh, saw a connection between climate change and homeland security, and that the frequency and intensity of powerful storms like uh, Harvey and Irma could pose a problem for future administrations. Uh, you could have uh, FEMA budgets uh, that uh, can't keep up with the demand when you have powerful storms hitting uh, the country. Is that something that you think this administration should take a look at? We know the uh, president pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, are these storms giving uh, this administration some pause when it comes to the issue of climate change and homeland security? 
I was here in the 2004 cycle of hurricanes, four and six weeks that hit Florida. I think what's prudent for us right now is to make sure that those response capabilities are there. Causality is something outside of my ability to analyze right now. I will tell you that we continue to take seriously uh, the climate change, not the cause of it, but the things that we observe. And so there's uh, rising floodwaters, I think one inch every 10 years in Tampa, things that would require prudent mitigation measures. And what I said from the podium the other day and what President Trump remains committed to uh, is making sure that federal dollars aren't used to rebuild things that will be in harm's way later or that won't be hardened against the future predictable floods that we see. And that has to do with engineering analysis and changing conditions uh, along eroding uh, shorelines, but also in inland uh, water and flood control projects. So, yeah, and just to follow up on that, when you see three Category 4 hurricanes all on the same map at the same time, does the thought occur to you, geez, you know, maybe Maybe there is something to this this climate change thing and its connection to powerful hurricanes. Uh, where it, where you just separate the two and say, boy, these are a lot of big hurricanes coming our way. Well, I don't know if I say either, but I do note that there's a cyclical nature of a lot of these hurricane seasons, and uh, I think. Uh, the scientists for their forecast on this particular one, uh, they were dead on that this would be a stronger and more powerful hurricane season with slightly more than average large storms making landfall in the United States. So we'll have to do a larger trend analysis at a later date. Oh, Sir. Yeah, uh, follow up a little bit on just the budget. What kind of pressure? You've had wildfires in the West, two major hurricane strikes. So what pressure on the federal government's budget has these natural disasters put? And how are we going to react to it? Are, are there going to be programs cut? Or are there going to be reassessments of what goes on in order to rebuild the infrastructure is going to take several years. Yeah, I think the President and, and Director Mulvaney and others started the process of a bipartisan discussion on this point. Uh, I think right now we have plenty of resources to get through this. That was the nature of the appropriation that we saw and the second appropriation that we will see at the end of this month subject to the regular uh, course of order in a fiscal year. We'll ask for a third, perhaps fourth, supplemental appropriation for the purpose of rebuilding. Uh, we'll do it smartly to the previous question. But in terms of pressure on the budget, this is a disaster relief fund issue. It's funded a little bit differently. And I have every belief that this president will end up with proposals, as he started his administration with, that will lead to a balanced budget. But uh, to get too far into how that works in the politics is way outside my lane. And I'll Just to follow up, it, it, at any point in time, as you're taking a, a look at this issue, is there any chance that FEMA, the EPA, and some of the uh, places that were cut will see more money go into their budget? Uh, I think that we'll put money in as money is needed to address the needs. So I think uh, what you'll see here is the same trend that I alluded to earlier. 2004, we had a large spike in disaster relief funding, but we also had to elevate the cap uh, on flood insurance, and we'll probably end up having to do that again here. Uh, you'll see, though, over a longer span of time, uh, even the flood insurance budget, flood insurance budget uh, is red and black, red and black again, based on claims uh, and based on premiums. So uh, we'll, anal we'll analyze it in that fashion, but I don't have any prediction for you on that. Uh, Ma'am in the middle. Tom, um, I asked you um, two weeks ago about Harvey, and you said, um, I asked you about housing. And I wanted to know if you had an update on the issues of housing since now we've got Harvey and now Irma and, and what else is coming along the way. Can you give us an update as to locating housing for those who've been displaced? Locating housing, housing in Texas? Housing in Texas, housing, yeah. I mean, it, for those who need housing, be it Texas, be it outside of the state, what yeah. have you for the moment. So I'll, I'll answer both. So in Texas, again, uh, going back to praising the governor, he's done what uh, we haven't seen done so well in the past, and that is he's owning the housing problem with a task force that he's initiated. He's also assigned a, a person to be in charge of long-term recovery. And there's four or five solutions to the housing problems in Texas, of course. Uh, some of them are short-lived, and what you'll have to do is find short-term solutions. People can stay in their home. It's been flooded. When, it's, uh, when the drywall is ripped out, when the repairs begin, they're going to have to find another place to live temporarily. So we try to find hotel solutions. Uh, in some cases, FEMA has initiated a manufactured housing solution where they'll put a mobile home or travel trailer on your property that you can live in for a period of time while your home's being repaired. Uh, those are the ideal solutions when there's enough acreage on your lot for that housing unit to sit. You can then move back into your home and we can remove that temporary unit. Uh, that's essentially the option that we have right now. Uh, the third option, of course, is just distance. So there's available rental stock, but you have to draw a larger circumference as people move away from their homes and into rental stock available farther away. So uh, we have some analysis done on the available rental stock and the available manufactured housing stock. Uh, we can get that to you after the podium brief here. Uh, in Florida, we'll have a slightly different issue, but we haven't assessed yet entirely what the damage is. So will it be that kind of like the same model. Florida will be the same model, but remember, it's a peninsula, 
and it's a wider scale problem and it's been a larger swath storm. And so what we'll do there is assess whether those are the right models or whether we have to apply some different creative solutions. If we do, we have the authorities and we have the budget to do so, uh, and we'll make sure people are taken care of. And during the first years, there was a very big concern about the mobile homes. Um, and, and then they wound up having issues with formaldehyde. Um, is that all cleared up, all of that concern before? There was, there was, a, there was a big concern about mobile home communities just, just being um, in place after Katrina. Is that kind of um, out of the mindset now, or is it still part of the mindset? No, the mindset of making sure that people have a safe place, place to live is, is, is still very much alive. Mm -hmm. What we do as a government is purchase available manufactured housing. We don't make it and we purchased it off the open market. I think the open market has improved their building practices, uh, and I think that we've improved through that experience and knowing who to buy from and who not to buy from. Uh, I also understand that uh, problems of ambient air quality continue to persist in, in our everyday lives. So I don't know uh, how much formaldehyde's in this room right now, uh, but I do know that formaldehyde is a carcinogen at any level. So uh, the, the point here is that we take it very seriously and we'll make sure we message very seriously the importance of, uh, of, of um, um, Know, basically ventilation so uh, but uh, to my knowledge we buy off of a better market now and we provide that solution in a more tailored and responsible manner uh, if I could uh, maybe come for it. Hey Tom a couple of questions about the conditions in Florida first of all more than half of Floridians are now without power <coughs> it's usually a, a very local issue but this is a catastrophe of a much grander scale when is it your assessment that people in Florida can expect to get their power back and what is What's the federal government's role in making that happen? So my numbers now are somewhere north of 5 million, uh, if the number's higher. I don't know if that constitutes half the people in Florida, but uh, I'll take your word for it. Households and businesses, so it's, it's a lot more so it's a significant. It's a significant number. Um, to the extent that a customer might have four people in the household, you'll see that number increase. The number of people then would be four in a home. The number of customers would be one, so that's right. the difference. Uh, the idea here is, as I said earlier, we all have a joint role in this. Uh, Florida Power and Light, Duke Electric, uh, others will all be bringing forces to bear here. The U.S. government brings to bear a number of forces that are uh, imperative to the restoration effort, like pushing debris out of the road and clearing roadways. Uh, yesterday, what we saw was not just the reports of, but the actual evidence of this will be the largest ever mobilization of line restoration workers in this country, period, end of story. They were already mobilized yesterday. Uh, they were at the Daytona Speedway. Uh, we will have line restoration workers from every company uh, in this country, from states all over the country, but also from Canada, coming to Florida to help restore the lines. And so in Florida, unlike in Houston where they're buried uh, power lines, in Florida they're all strung on poles. So we have to restore the poles, restring the lines, and the way that process works is they restore the plant, then the subplant, then, house, then line by line into each road, and then house by house. And you can't hook up each house until the homeowner makes sure that it's safe. You don't want to burn the house down with flood damage and corroded lines and so forth. So uh, it is a literally joint effort from federal clearing to uh, public and private partnerships to line restoration efforts that are partnered in the for-profit and regulated world all the way through to the individual homeowner. So that's how that process so works. What's your assessment of how long that's going to take? I, I would, I would caution people to be very patient here between re-entry and that process. We could have uh, power down in homes for the coming weeks. Weeks. Now, I don't want to cause any panic in Florida, and I'll come to a question here next. There are hospitals and nursing homes and other facilities that have generator power to provide services that are necessary. And there, the concern is providing fuel to those generators should they run out. And, and from that perspective, the federal government provides a great deal of fuel, a great deal of transport assistance through Transcom and other contracts, and we give that fuel to the state and locals, and they distribute it to those uh, you know, I said wholesale and retail distribution, that's the best analogy, they distribute it to those facilities. And so that's our role there as well, and we expect that to happen seamlessly. Sir? Is preventing price gouging in the state of Florida a federal responsibility, or is that up to the state officials in Florida and local officials? There? It can be both, and I think you'll hear from the Attorney General later, so I'll let him explain to you what he'll do to prevent fraud. I think he's going to announce an effort on that uh, this week. Uh, and I think you've already heard Pam Bondi announce that she is conducting active uh, gouging and anti-fraud fraud practices when there are state and local laws at play. So uh, both is the answer, uh, but I can tell you that neither officials, the Attorney General of the United States or the Attorney General or Attorneys General of the states are going to tolerate gouging. I think that's something that people ought to think twice about. Sir? There is a possibility of a third and fourth supplemental for disaster relief. Can you tell us how much money the administration 
once included in, this, in those supplementals? And are you going to put language uh, raising the cap for flood insurance in that legislation as well? So on the first point, no. The reason we pursued this approach is we're trying to make sure that we have responsible estimates as opposed to making wild guesses now. Uh, we're going for the amount of money we need to get through this response operation phase. And as we transition into recovery, we'll analyze the damage, figure out how much money we might need, and go up for another responsible request. If we got that wrong, then we'd go for another if necessary. Uh, it's not necessarily wrong, but if we... Uh, estimate a world and find actuals don't meet those estimates, then we'll go up and rectify. Uh, with respect to flood insurance, we'll see how many claims come in, but the flood insurance program had $8.6 billion roundabout uh, available to it. If claims exceed that amount, we'll go up and ask for the cap to be raised. Okay. Sir. I was hoping you could drill down a bit more on the efforts to evacuate Americans in the Caribbean. You described the military mobilization. I know that the State Department has stood up a task force. Uh, they're working around the clock in their operations. Can, can you assess those efforts? And can you give a message to Americans who are right now in dire straits in the Caribbean who might be listening to this? What should the expectation be for an evacuation? How soon can the Americans get the Americans out? Well, I'm preaching caution to make sure people understand that this is an ongoing effort and that there's still going to be long, painful days ahead. I am doubling down on my assertion that this is the best integrated full-scale response effort in our nation's history. That includes the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico and non-U.S. Uh, islands where we helped American citizens during a window of operational uh, uh, safety between Jose and Irma. Uh, this has been a large event and you're going to see a lot of positive stories from it. Now control expectations. You're on an island where we have to transport commodities, food and water, where we have to, a long road ahead of us to bring electric power back online. Uh, but we've assembled two of the most powerful naval relief flotillas in recent memory, a total of nine large ships. Uh, I'm going to just cut right to the uh, Kearsarge, Oak Hill, Wasp, McLean, and the U.S., uh, the Abraham Lincoln, the Iwo Jima, uh, the Farragut in New York. Th that is a aircraft carrier and large uh, platforms for helicopters, 80 or more helicopters flying sorties right now. That is an operation that for most Americans, if you can't picture it, has never been mobilized for this type of uh, emergency response effort in our history. And so to the extent that I can assess it, I'm pretty proud of that. To the extent that it meets the need, I'm going to hope it does because we're saving hundreds if not thousands of people off of these islands at this point collectively. And so if the, if the burn rate's not fast enough, I'd be surprised because we're mobilizing ourselves in ways that we've never mobilized before. And Governor Mapp, the President of the United States, and, and the Governor of Puerto Rico, Rosello, were all very pleased in their phone calls today. So I'm in no better position from this podium than they are from their locations to assess it as a positive outcome. So, Sir. Uh, with so many people who evacuated from the Keys and given the level of destruction there, any time estimate on when people might be able to return to the Keys? The Keys are going to take a while. We have not assessed the structural integrity of the bridges there. There's some early reason to believe that some of the drawbridges that were up may or may not have been bent. And so res restoring those is going to take some time. Uh, that Route 1 is a large, expansive bridge, essentially. Uh, all of the undergirding there has to be examined for structural integrity. I would expect that the keys are not fit for re-entry for regular citizenry for weeks. Uh, and uh, if, if that's wrong and I'm wrong, then fine, then let the local officials bring you in. But I would set that expectation uh, pretty broad right now. And I would say that for the people that chose to stay, they had every warning to leave. We hope that they took that warning. And those that didn't, we're going to get back down there as soon as we humanly can. Uh, and right now we don't know. We had three or four overflights today. I talked to the FEMA administrator just before coming out here, uh, and he is not certain yet that we've had a good overflight assessment of where all those people might be. Uh, neither of us would be surprised if lives were lost, uh, but neither of us would be surprised if the responders are going to get down there aggressively. So uh, we're doing everything we can to help them. So I uh, see Sarah. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to actually end on that if I could uh, and, and end where I started. Uh, today is the day of uh, solemnity and remembrance for 9-11. Uh, it is uh, why I got into this business and it's why I believe uh, our government is now organized uh, for the level of, uh, of response that we've seen. And it, it just goes to kind of show what we've got if we want to bring ourselves together and helping our fellow humans under good leadership from President Trump. I think we've put forward a good effort. Please, for the people in Florida, continue to follow the instructions of your first responders and your local authorities. This isn't over yet and it's going to be a painful slightly frustrating, if not very frustrating, week or two ahead. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Tom. As he wrapped up, he uh, 
reiterated the the need to listen to local authorities. Uh, I know that the governor of Florida is getting ready to hold a press conference. I'm going to try to take as many questions as we can, but I also want to make sure that uh, everyone's able to tune in for that and uh, cover that extensively. Um, finally, uh, before I take your question, several of you have asked about the U.S. response to the ongoing violence in Burma, and I'd like to read uh, part of a statement that will be coming out shortly on that topic. The United States is deeply troubled by the ongoing crisis in Burma, where at least 300,000 people have fled their homes in the wake of attacks on Burmese security post on August 25th. We re reiterate our condemnation of those attacks and ensuing violence. And with that, I'll take your questions. Jeff. Uh, Sarah, two questions. One, do you have a reaction to Steve Bannon's comments on 60 Minutes uh, saying that the firing of James Comey was uh, the biggest political mistake in modern history? And secondly, if you could look forward to tomorrow a little bit at uh, the President's meeting with the Malaysian Prime Minister, uh, what do you expect to achieve during that meeting and will the President address or avoid the issue of the U.S. investigation uh, into him? Yeah, uh, pretty wide-ranging topic, so I'll try to make sure I cover it. Uh, First, on uh, the Comey firing, I think that we've been pretty clear what our position is, uh, and certainly I think that that has been shown uh, in the days that followed that the President was right in firing Director Comey uh, since Director's firing. Uh, we've learned new information about his conduct um, that only provided further justification for that firing, including giving false testimony, leaking privileged information to journalists. He went outside of the chain of command and politicized an investigation into a presidential candidate. I think the President's been very clear about his position on that front. Uh, he's very pleased with the new director um, and has full confidence in him to fully restore and lead the FBI. In terms of Malaysia and on that question, uh, hard transition, but I'll, I'll try to uh, make sure we cover that. Uh, the United States and Malaysia have had a 60-year relationship and partnership built on common economic and security interests, and that continues. And the President looks forward to discussing a wide variety and wide range of regional and security issues with the Prime Minister um, and talking about ways that they can strengthen counterterrorism, cooperation, certainly uh, the halt of ISIS, uh, addressing North Korea and their continued actions. Uh, and making sure that we promote maritime security in the South China Sea. Those are certainly, I think, some of the um, priorities of tomorrow's meeting, but I'm not going to get ahead much further than that on any conversation that may take place. Uh, look, we're not going to comment on an ongoing uh, investigation being led by the Department of Justice, and that investigation is apolitical and certainly independent of anything taking place tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I also have a question on Mr. Bannon's interview. During that, he said, I think Mitch McConnell and to a degree Paul Ryan, they do not want Donald Trump's populist economic nationalist agenda to be implemented. It's very obvious. It's as obvious as night follows day. Uh, first of all, does the President agree with that obvious characterization of McConnell and Ryan? Uh, the President's committed to working with Congress to get some big things done. We've got a very big agenda. Uh, the President wants to work with all members of Congress. Obviously, that includes Republican leadership as well as Democrats. I think you saw some of the President's leadership last week uh, when he helped strike a deal to make sure that we got the funding that was necessary. We're focused on moving things forward, and, and certainly that's the goal and the priority of the administration. So that, would he like to see, given his past criticisms of Mr. McConnell and Ryan, would he like to see different leadership in the Republican Congress? Look, right now the President is committed to working with the leadership we have um, and nothing beyond that at this point. Exactly. John. Uh, sir, just to follow up on, on Bannon's comments, he actually went, he, he said all that about McConnell and Ryan, but also said that they were, they wanted to nullify the 2016 election results. So just a, just a simple yes or no question, does the President agree with that assessment? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I haven't had that conversation with him, Jonathan. Is he still talking to Steve Bannon? Is he still seek his counsel on the outside? Uh, I know that I've had one conversation, but I don't think anything beyond that since he left. John Decker. Um, I'll just keep that. I think we may be answering more questions on Steve Bannon now that he's not here than when he was, but go ahead. <laughs> You might about that. Did the President happen to watch the interview? Any reaction? Did you happen to watch the interview on 60 Minutes? Any I'm reaction? not sure if he saw it in its entirety. I know he has seen clips of it, but I don't know that he watched the entire thing. Uh, I did watch parts of it. What was your reaction to it? As a former, as a former colleague of yours who worked here at the White House, 
Um, were you disappointed with any of his comments? Were you surprised by any of his comments? Did you like the fact that a former staffer is speaking so openly about some of the, some of the inner workings of what happens here at the White House on a regular basis? I'm sure it made uh, for great TV, and I'm, I'm sure CBS will be happy to put those ratings out. As for me, I'm here to speak on behalf of the administration. Francesca? Why ruin a good thing, Sarah? <laughs> Keep on is that what Bannon. this is, a good thing? Today <laughs> <laughs> on the topic of Steve Bannon, another comment he made was that dreamers should consider self-deporting when their work permits run out. Is that something that the White House thinks is realistic, that the dreamers would voluntarily leave the country when those work permits run out? And is that something the president thinks that they should do? The administration's been clear what our position is. We're hoping that Congress will step up and do their job and fix this problem and implement responsible immigration reform and addressing that problem would be part of it. Yeah, just like that they would leave. Mm -hmm. Last week, Nancy Pelosi told the president would sign the Dream Act. Is that accurate? Would the president sign the DREAM Act? Again, the president and the administration are looking at responsible immigration reform, and part of that uh, would be part of that process, but we want to do uh, something that addresses a multitude of issues. And, and again, Congress has six months to do their job. We're very hopeful and confident that they will. In his 60 Minutes interview, Steve Bannon said that this discussion over DACA could lead to a civil war in the Republican Party. How, how and why is he wrong about that? Uh, I think that... Uh, Steve always likes to speak in kind of uh, the most extreme measures. I'm not sure that I agree with that. John? Uh, on a different topic. Oh, um, wow. In, in, recent, in recent weeks. Maybe you get two questions. <laughs> in recent, in just, in just a matter of weeks, two storms that have been categorized as once in 500 years or even longer, major events have hit the United States. In light of that, has the president given any thought to reviewing his decision to leave the Paris climate accords? Uh, I, I'm not sure specifically on the, the Paris climate deal, but as he said at the time, the goal is to always do our very best uh, when it comes to taking care of the environment and taking proper steps. The United States is one of the best in the world at doing this. We want to continue to do that. Um, but right now, the administration is focused on the recovery and relief efforts. And as Tom said a few minutes ago, we'll look at that analysis uh, once we get through the coming days and, and focus on the recovery and relief and saving life effort taking place. Hallie? Two questions to follow up on John question a little bit here, and since you said you do speak for the administration, can you clarify whether the president believes human activity contributes to climate change? The president's addressed this already. I'm Mike, asking you to address you. that's changed given these storms. Uh, I, I don't think that it's changed um, over the last several weeks, and again, he's addressed it his opinion on that several times. So question, actually, on something that happened back on August 10th, as you know, which is the president declaring that he wanted to have a, a national emergency when it came to the opioid crisis. It has now been more than a month since he said that. That's a delay for a president who likes to do things quickly, as he has often said. Is the president taking this seriously enough, and when does he intend to declare this emergency and actually get the ball rolling on that? Absolutely taking it very seriously. Uh, the commission and members of the administration have continued to meet and work on the details of that uh, national declaration, and that's certainly a big priority for the administration, and we'll continue to focus on pushing that through. It's taking so long. You know, this is a president who so likes it's to a, it's a much more things. involved process, and that's something that they're working through on the legal side, the administrative side, and making sure that it's done correctly. Uh, I ask about uh, Steve uh, Manucci. Yeah. <laughs> tricky, tricky, Bender. He and Cohen are going up to uh, uh, the Senate tomorrow to talk to the Budget Committee. What do they want that budget resolution to look like, and does the administration support the House budget? Look, I don't want to get ahead of their uh, conversations, um, and I'll let Secretary Mnuchin, I, I think, plans to address that in further detail tomorrow. John? I want to see Mnuchin real quickly. Uh, he took some criticism last week from Republicans for his handling of the debt deal. Uh, what, what does the President think of uh, Secretary Mnuchin's performance so far? Uh, the President has confidence in Secretary Mnuchin and is glad that he is part of the effort uh, working with uh, Gary Cohn to get tax reform done this year. John. Just to drill down a little bit on what you said a moment ago regarding James Comey, you said uh, that he was uh, responsible for giving false testimony. Do you believe that Comey either perjured himself before Congress or at the very least misled Congress in his testimony? I think that's something probably for DOJ to look at, not me. I'm not an attorney. Jen? Two questions, one on um, the Equifax leak and one on tax reform. Um, if, if a big tax reform bill doesn't pass by December, would the President support adding middle class tax cuts to the, the end of the year tax extenders bill that the Congress has to pass? We're, you know, we're focused on making sure we get a complete tax reform package. That's the goal. 
he would support. Right now, that's the focus, and if that doesn't happen, we'll look at other options at that point. Um, America's personal data security after the Equifax leak is more regulation warranted for the handling of Americans' personal data? I think this is something we have to look into extensively. 